Hello and welcome back to the Polaris Travel Health Podcast. Thanks for tuning in with us this week. Uh, this week, Jaden and I will be discussing uh, the popular destination and a place where we see a lot of people coming in for travel consults, Peru. Yeah, I think uh, we both thought it would be interesting to kind of explore a few common travel destinations that you see in the clinic. I wanted to give kind of like a bit of a background to Peru as well, though. So Peru is a highly diverse country. It has three official languages, actually, which are Amaya, Quechua, and Spanish. They also have one of the most diverse landscapes in the world with about 90 different microclimates, uh, despite being about eight times smaller than Canada. Uh, A fun fact that I saw in my research about Peru was that about three quarters of the world's 10 million alpacas live in Peru. But uh, what can you tell us about it, Jason? I love alpacas. I had no idea. That. <laughs> I told my friends that and they thought that was really cool. So. I, I'm, I'm like, I know that, you know, alpaca is obviously a South American a- animal, but I had no idea. Like when you pulled out that number, I'm like, That's, uh, yeah. So, well, anyway, what, what can I tell you about Peru here from, from my standpoint? It's not a place I've been to, but uh, certainly we have seen we have seen a lot of people coming in for travel consults and it is an interesting country. There's a lot of different things to see and do there kind of depends, I guess, on, on, you know, what you're looking for, but, but uh, it's maybe not necessarily um, the high class, like luxury. If you're doing the luxury shopping type tour or something like that, maybe it's not for you, but if you're looking for, you know, um, historical things and some ecotourism, um, it's definitely a, a, a place that, is a, is a good place to look at and relatively easy to get to from Canada. Right, right. So one major thing that I kind of wanted to talk about and that we talk about in uh, a lot of things is what are the health concerns that you might encounter in different areas of Peru? Like, should you be concerned about something like, like mosquito-borne illnesses, yellow fever, malaria, things like that? Yeah, definitely those are concerns. So um, I guess maybe one place where I'll maybe... I would probably want to start off here is to talk about what we typically see from travelers going to Peru that book a consult. So I I don't want to like paint everyone necessarily with the same brush per se, but generally speaking, most people fly into Lima, the capital, which is on the coast. So it's at sea level and it's on the coast. You know, it's a um, relatively modern place and it's urban place. But um, most people don't spend a lot of time there. That's where you fly into the country. And and most of the time, people at that point then fly into Cusco, which is where you basically start if you're going to go to Machu Picchu, which is really the big number one tourist attraction in, in, in Peru. So very commonly, people will fly into Cusco, then they'll trek and they'll go to Machu Picchu, that sort of thing, and then usually make their way back to Cusco. Then usually the other part of it, that's where it can get a little more diverse because pretty much everybody go, does the Cusco thing. But then at that point, you're starting to look at afterwards, are you going to go to the Amazon? Are you going to go do some ecotourism and that, that sort of thing? Are you going to go to Lake Titicaca? Are you going to go to someplace on the coast? So that's kind of the first thing you always have to look at here when it comes down to what kind of precautions you know, I always try and break things down by, you know, eating and drinking bugs and, and vaccines. So right now, I would tell you when you're asking about, I guess we're finally getting back to the bug stuff. For From a mosquito standpoint, certainly we're not too worried about anything at the higher altitudes because mosquitoes really don't do well at the altitudes that, you know, Cusco is or Lake Titicaca. But meanwhile, if you do opt to do something like the Amazon, then you are starting to look at things like malaria as being a concern. And yeah, dengue is always potentially a concern at the lower altitudes as well, even potentially along the coast. Right. What about other types of diseases or other kind of like things that could get you? Well, you know, if you start thinking about, you know, other, you know, vaccine preventable things, yellow fever is potentially a thing, you know, as we've talked about yellow fever in the past and it is one vaccine where some countries you have to have it to get into the country. Peru doesn't care. You don't need any paperwork to get in into Peru regarding yellow fever. But there right. are some yellow fever risk areas. Usually it's in the lower altitudes on the eastern part of the country, usually in that Amazon basin area. Like if you are sort of getting into the really jungly 
uh, rainforesty areas, you're not going to run into it in the coast. You're not going to run into the high altitudes in, in Peru, uh, in Cusco and stuff. Other things we'd want to think about, you know, I think we, we always would think about, you know, hepatitis A being a concern. Uh, and and even with, with typhoid, I think that is something where maybe the risk isn't quite as high as perhaps maybe it is in some parts of Asia. But I still think that if you're going, and especially if you're going to be spending a little bit longer period of time and you're going to be there, not necessarily like not just doing a, a quick in and out business trip in Lima for three days or something. It's probably one another one we would we would want to look at. And of course, traveler's diarrhea always a concern. I think the traveler's diarrhea risk is is pretty considerable. And and you know I would definitely be looking at you know food and beverage precautions like usual hand washing, taking some antibiotics with you, uh, having them prescribed. And if you do get traverse diarrhea in a severe way that you can uh, self-treat with antibiotics. And also Ducarol as a preventative measure for the prevention of traverse diarrhea. You know, it, its value is, is, you know, sometimes a bit limited. It's not foolproof, but it is a nice layer of protection as well. Right. So what about other types of safety concerns that might pose a threat to people that are traveling to Peru? Well, when you start talking about safety concerns, I think one thing that uh, you can always think about here is like violence and trouble along borders. Like there is some drug trafficking issues in, in Peru, just like there is in a lot of other South American countries. What I would tell you right now is that you're most likely, if you're staying in the typical tourist areas, your risk is relatively low. If you do get out into really remote areas, places that 99% of the tourists probably don't go to, then you could maybe be more at risk for kidnapping or something like that and foreigners being a target. But I would tell 99% of the people going to Peru that that's probably not going to be a huge issue. You know, I think when you start thinking about you know, other things, you obviously don't want to make yourself a target, you know, being around ATMs at night and, you know, wearing expensive clothes and that sort of thing. You know, I think you, you know, common sense precautions prevail. You know, I think whenever you start thinking about these locations where they're highly dependent on tourists, you know, I think it's sort of understood that, you know, affecting the tourism industry could be a really bad choice for a petty thief because they could, the repercussions could be worse if you do something to a tourist. But that being, being said, like I still think you know, common sense precautions definitely prevail. Right. Yeah. Just being kind of like aware of your surroundings at all times. One thing that I always do and that um, I always say for people is to like wear your purse crossbody. And another thing is if you don't normally carry a bag with you, like if you're out and about and you're carrying, say, like a camera bag with you, which you normally wouldn't, it's very important that you like continue to make sure that you have it with you because it's not something that you normally would carry. So it's, you have to kind of like be extra checking your list of things that you have with you. Totally. That's good advice, Jaden. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So after kind of like focusing on some of the more concerning things or things that might be, um, threatening i wanted to kind of chat about the fun stuff that you might see or do in peru like when you have people who come in for consultations what kind of things do you hear from them what types of things do you think that you would recommend from a fun perspective you know, i think like i said before most people going to cusco and machu picchu is really kind of the high point of this a lot of times you'll see people that will be doing things that will be self-guided but a lot of people are also on tours so i think that um when you start thinking about going there, like that's probably one of the coolest experiences. And then other things, there are a couple other things worth mentioning. I think one is called, I believe they're called the Nazca lines. They're down in the Southern part, sort of the South West part of the country, not far from the, the ocean. There's some really un unusual formations and nobody really understands how they got there and, and, and everything. And of course, some people say that aliens made them or whatever. Uh, <laughs> they're they're kind of cool. And then, of course, you know, if you want to get your tropical jungle ecotourism fix, there's no shortage of opportunities in, in this part of the world. You know, typically speaking, we don't see a lot of people going to Peru for like beachy coastal things. I think mostly because if you're going to 
if you're going to pick a country to go do that sort of thing, you probably will just pick another country because what makes Peru unique is, is sort of these things. Uh, if, you know, if you want a beach holiday, you know, there's places closer in Central America and, and where I think that industry is a little bit more established. So, so I think that those are the kinds of things you see. And of course, you know, there's lots of, you know, cultural stuff to see in this part of the world as well and things to eat and, things to buy. There's a few things down there that I, I would not, uh, you know, guinea pig is a thing to eat down there, you know? And, right. <laughs> yeah. So. Yes. I remember uh, reading about when I was younger that they, the guinea pigs are quite like important culturally and that they kind of like will dress them up sometimes and then, but they also will eat them too. Yeah. I think there's that, the, Sounds about right. So yeah, it's uh, it's always a story that you can come you can uh, come back with, I guess. Definitely, definitely. Okay, anything else you want to mention about Peru? Anything unique that you've heard of, or anything like that? Well, I think the one thing that I somehow just skipped over, and I was waiting to the end to talk about, it, is altitude sickness. It's it's right. probably one of the the big reasons we talk to people when they're going to Peru because people will sort of be have some level of awareness about altitude sickness and it being a thing. So we've already covered this on a previous podcast, I believe, but I just want to sort of reiterate how it would be relevant in, in uh, on this trip. So altitude sickness basically is your body's inability to sort of uh, adjust easily adjust to a, an altitude increase. Symptoms are very much like a hangover. So whenever you get past 7,500 feet, there's a risk of developing altitude sickness. And everybody will eventually get it at some height or another. But when you look at Cusco, for example, and geez, off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I think Cusco is 11,000 feet above sea level. So anyway, the bottom line is when you're flying in from Lima to Cusco, you will not be acclimatizing to any degree from the plane because basically Lima is at sea level because it's on the coast. And then when you're starting to talk about flying into Cusco, then all of a sudden you get off the plane and it's 11,000 feet. So a lot of people will feel kind of woozy and kind of yuck shortly after they arrive at Cusco. Like I've run into situations where I've talked to people and they've said by the time they get to the hotel room, uh, by the time they grab their bags at the airport and get a, a cab and get to the hotel, they, they can already feel it. So, so it's definitely a thing. And, um, there are a couple things that you can do preventatively and treatment wise. Treatment wise, you can always self treat, you know, with a pain reliever or treat your symptoms. Also, a good idea to not do a lot of big activity right when you get to Cusco. If you even look at some of these itineraries and, and tour packages, most all of them have a, a setup where basically you arrive in Cusco and you spend the first day or so, you know, wandering around Cusco, looking at the shops. That's not a coincidence. They do that on purpose because if you are feeling really lousy, they don't want you basically to jump off the plane and, and start trekking and start going to Machu Picchu. So usually they have it set up in such a way that you have a little bit of time. It really takes about three days to fully acclimatize to an altitude, but most of these tours build in at least a day in Cusco to sort of get your bearings and stuff. And then of course, from a preventative and treatment standpoint, there is a product like acetazolamide, which you can take in advance of leaving, usually 24 hours before you get to high altitude, and then you take it uh, until you've been at high, the highest altitude for a few days. And this stuff is something which can help prevent some of the symptoms of altitude sickness and also treat uh, at a higher dose. So it's something that we prescribe pretty regularly to this part of the world. It's relatively straightforward, easy to take stuff. Uh, the main side effects are can make you go to the bathroom a little bit more, can like uh, increases your urination because it's a diuretic, makes anything carbonated taste weird. And then the other thing is, is that in some people it can cause a little bit of tingling in the fingers and toes. And that's the only real side effect, which I find to be kind of problematic. And if it's really problem, most people, it's no big deal. But for some people, if they are having a lot of trouble with it, then I just advise them to discontinue. But it's um, a long used medicine and it's inexpensive and the dosing schedule is pretty flexible. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice thing to have with you, especially if you've ever had trouble with altitude in the past. Right, right. Yeah, I, I remember us talking about um, acetazolamide in the altitude sickness 
um, episode. And I thought that, you know, it seemed like a pretty well tolerated drug, if not something with perhaps unique side effects, not just like, oh, I have a headache or oh, I feel a little feel a little strange, but that, you know, you can't you can't have any sparkling water because it's going to taste like licking a sink. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, that is like, you know, that's a weird part of it, but it's, uh, but yeah, it, it, in the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively straightforward thing to take. Lots of times I'll, I'll advise people, if they've never been to high altitude, you should just be prepared to ha um, have, you know, it, that it could happen to you. And the nice thing about a Cezolmide is, you know, I don't know, when we fill a prescription for like, I don't know, 20 tablets, it's like $13 or something. And that's if you don't even have a drug plan. So right. it's really pretty cheap stuff so i don't really look at you know there aren't a lot of downsides to really getting some before your trip so that's usually how i try to approach it yes yeah okay anything else you want to mention i think that was that was pretty informative for the uh for the altitude sickness i think that not perhaps everyone would know that that would be a concern yeah yeah and look back in our archives if you want to hear a lot more about altitude sickness and uh um, we probably got into it a little bit more there, which is, if you want a little more info, that might be a good place. But yeah, I think we've covered it. Like I said, this is a pretty common destination and, and one that certainly we see a lot of people, you know, I think when you run into situations, uh, on a trip like this, like sometimes people, if they're just doing a, what they perceive as being a pretty straightforward trip, if they're going to like a resort in Cancun for a week, you know, we do see a lot of patients like that, but um, sometimes some people may not think it, it's as relevant, but when you have people going to Peru, like I think it, one of the first things they think about is, oh, geez, that's kind of a bit more of a rough around the edges country. And there's a couple more other things to think about. I, I probably need to go in and talk to someone who knows about from my health perspective. And so we definitely see a lot of those appointments and, and uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty fun. Awesome. All right, then. Well, thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of the Polaris Travel Health Podcast. A reminder that the information and the advice we provided in this podcast are not a substitute for live medical advice tailored to your itinerary and your medical history. If you have questions or maybe you're going to Peru, please head over to our website, www.polaristravelclinic.ca. Also, check us out on Twitter at Polaris Travel Rx and our Facebook page as well. We hope you'll tune in again with us next week. Thanks, Jaden. Thank you.